Hello, Klaus. Um, yeah. You are my favorite 60601 expert. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a very specific uh, question to you today, which involves um, uh, the standard or a particular version of it. And my question to you is whether conformity with IEC 60601-1-2 is sufficient to demonstrate conformity uh, with the regulatory requirements related to electromagnetic compatibility. That's really, it's it's even challenging to just ask the question, right? So, I was to say that's a very detailed question, Peter. It is, but I would be very interested in learning from you if that is correct or true, or if it is sufficient. So fire away, Klaus. Okay, no, it's not sufficient. Oh, it's not, there right? All done. No, uh, 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 and the more detailed uh, answer is, of course, that uh, the safety standard for electromagnetic disturbances is IC 60601-1-2. But that's a safety-only standard. And the regulatory requirement, both in EU under the MBR and in the US, the FDA expectation is that the manufacturer demonstrates that the device is safe. There you can use the standard, but you also have to demonstrate that it is performing so it's effective and that's not covered by the safety standard at all so there's another publication out there uh, the number is ICTS it's a technical specification so ICTS 60601-4-2 and that is aligned with EU and FDA expectations to demonstrate conformity with performance requirements considering the electromagnetic use environment. So it's the same basic tests. It's eight to 10 tests you will go ahead and do, uh, but the acceptance criteria and the test levels are different. So when you do safety testing, you test at high test levels to ensure that your device is safe, but there it shall meet the requirements for basic safety and essential performance. So it's simply safety and then at the lower performance test levels, you have to meet the acceptance criteria to demonstrate that your device actually works. Just like you would test it without the EMC or, or the uh, interference of electromagnetic. Uh, yeah, it, it should perform, it should work as intended. Basically, yeah. So in the uh, during the safety testing, it may be acceptable for a device to stop working if it does so in a safe way. So it can trigger an alarm or it can go into a safe fallback mode or whatever, if it's just obvious to the operator that the device no longer functions as intended. And I guess that's like if an X-ray machine that is not used in a critical situation just fails to work, it just shuts down and doesn't work. There is basically no risk in that situation. But if it's a ventilator that stops because someone brings up their mobile phone, then, then you're in trouble, right? Uh, you could be, uh, depends on where it's used, but typically the ventilator is an excellent example because if it is used in a critical care setting where you will have trained nurses and doctors on call to come and assist you, and it fails in a way where it opens up the gas pathway so they can manually ventilate the patient when the alarm triggers, then it could be acceptable. Okay, it can be. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that. No, but okay. Yeah, but you have those acceptance criteria then that uh, it shall trigger an alarm in a way that alerts the operators to come to the patient's rescue and it shall fail in a way where they can actually ventilate the patient. That's almost like this with a hand crank on roller pumps in heart lung machines. So when you bypass the heart, if the roller pump stops, you're supposed to put in a hand crank and pump which is uh, exactly the same issue. I just have to share a story, non-electrical one on this topic. Uh, it was a, a, a pump that stopped and they put in the hand crank uh, during a surgery and they could not pump. Do you know why? Because the pump had not stopped due to regular technical failures, but a screw had unscrewed itself underneath the roller pump head. So it was completely mechanically stopped. So you couldn't turn it with a hand crank or with a motor or anything. So they very quickly had to sort of move the tubing to another pump, which they had more of them, luckily. Got it started. The patient did not get, you know, any harm. But I I would not have wanted to be that, you know, anesthesiologist and uh, perfusionist sitting there with a hand crank and nothing works. <laughs> 
Oh, that's quite so important to, to specify these acceptance criteria and to consider both the safety levels, the performance levels and all that. I think regarding the hand crank, by the way, I'm, we, we should probably have a separate medical advice talk about that one because I can dig into the root cause of that one, which is quite interesting. But thank you so much for sharing that. So the short answer is no, the 60601-1-2 is not sufficient because that's only safety, right? You also yeah. have to make sure that the performance is there. And the standard then was IECTS, the technical specification number, what was it again? 60601-4-2. And also there's an FDA guidance document that talks about this topic. And there's an American AMI standard, um, which is called the CR500, that also talks about this topic. But there are no less than four different standards and guidelines that you need to take into account to get this right. That's great. Thank you very much for sharing that, Klaus. And I'll see you in another medical advice talk.